What is happening, everyone? Welcome to Mailbag Monday. You're watching KMRD Radio Stuff. This is episode number nine already. Do you believe that? Nine times. Name that movie. Wow. I can't believe it. If you have a question, shoot me an email. KMRD at iCloud.com. Make sure you put in the subject Mailbag Monday so I will actually pay attention to this email instead of completely ignoring it. Uh, got some great questions today. So let's dive right in. The first one I want to give, uh, this was actually a really lengthy email and uh, it was very, very touching. I only took a little snippet of it, but I want to give some words of encouragement and this is kind of dealing with, um, let's just call it Mike Fright. So let's jump right in here to kind of summarize. This gentleman's been in the hobby since 1973 when he, when he was 15 and uh, he listens, but he's, he never gets on the air. Over my tenure as an amateur radio, I have never made a single contact in any mode, not one. I share this information to help add context to the fact that I truly admire your courage, blah, blah, blah. I keep telling myself that this will be the year, the month, the week, the day when I make my first contact. Whenever that day unfolds, it will largely be due to how you've helped simplify the basic operation of a QSO on your YouTube channel. So thank you, one, for your wonderful letter. You know who you are. We'll call him Mr. X. And I got a chance to look at his QRZ page, and I just kind of want to briefly give you a little bit of bio. Uh, licensed in 73 at 15, uh, listened for a, for a long time. Fast forward 47 years, life got in the way. He, he let his license lapse. And uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic passed, or when the COVID-19 pandemic happened, rather, uh, he decided to relicense himself. He passed his tech and his general in the same sitting, bought himself a Zygu G90 and a Camille and MPOS 2.0 uh, in November 2020. In December 2020, he passed his X exam and it awarded himself with another transceiver, this time an, uh, an ICOM 7300. 2021, uh, got his application for his vanity granted. April 2021, picked up an ICOM 705. Later that month, he was fortunate enough to receive a wonderful ICOM 7610 in a sweepstakes contest. Dude, everyone in the world would love to win that. Uh, later in 2021, picked up a plethora of very lightly used equipment. 9700, 8600, QIT KT 8900, Yasu 891, FTDX 10, several HTs including an ICOM 91A, Kenwood THD 74, uh, Wushan Ocean KG UV 6D, KG UV 8D, Yasu FT 3DR, FT 4XR, VX 6R, VX 8R, TYT UV 88, and an Anytone 878 plus. <sighs> You have more stuff than most people will ever dream about having. Uh, so congratulations on the great station. Now, let me tell you, as uh, someone who knows Mike Fright uh, from a musician back when I was a, you know, a, gosh, a kid in middle school, I think was the first time I got on stage. That feeling you get those butterflies in your stomach are real. And it's just, I mean, it'll hit you like a wall of bricks. And you just you 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 want to go and you want to go and mm, on stage they so you know there's many tricks imagine everyone in their underwear and everything yeah sure that works for the pretty girls but not so much for the ugly dudes uh, <laughs> the only thing I can tell you is the feeling of accomplishment and excitement when you push that PTT for the first time and make that first contact something magic happens at least for me anyways i remember my first uh my first hf contact was just to uh one of the guys on the omis net they were taking check-ins and i was like hey let's do this i got in i was amazed it floored me that i could sit here and talk to someone halfway across the country on a wire antenna that i built and I was using a uh, Yasu FT450 at the time. That was my first HF rig. And just amazed. And, and I made two contacts that night. They both sent me uh, QSL cards. What really got it for me was my first DX contact. And that was Slavko, Sierra 5.1 Delta X-Ray. Or is it 5.7? I can't remember. In Slovenia. With 100 watts and a wire. To talk all the way across the Atlantic Ocean into Slovenia. With my, with my humble 100 watt station, if there were cameras on me, <laughs> it would be the laughing stock of the neighborhood because I was so excited. I was literally screaming like a little girl. 
I was so amazed. So hopefully that can be some words of encouragement. Here's another bit of advice. If you don't want to just talk to someone, you know, the easiest thing that I would suggest doing to get that first contact, find someone doing a summits on the air or a parks on the air uh, contact or some kind of DX contact, you know, try and get somebody to work a pile up because those guys aren't looking to talk. We're looking to exchange call signs and signal reports. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and that's it. So very, very quick uh, way to overcome that mic fright or that shyness or whatever whatever it is that's keeping you from pushing that PTT button. That might be a good uh, a good thing for you. So I wanted to just, I wanted to put this on first because encouraging others is is a, a huge part of this channel and, and sharing the excitement and the love and the passion. And, and kind of trying to pay that forward is, is really what myself and, and every other ham YouTuber that I know uh, at the bottom of our hearts is really why we're doing what we're doing. So, uh, Mr. X, thank you so much for the beautiful letter. Uh, uh, I'm very humbled by your words. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I, I hope, I really do hope that uh, you, you make the step and, uh, and get on the air. Oh, hey, use me for your first contact. I'm out POTA all the time. Go to POTA.app, look at the spotting page. If you see me there, throw out your call sign. Uh, I won't even know who you are because when we're in the moment, it just, it just goes. So um, that, would be, that would be an honor to be your first contact. Do that. Uh, so yeah, awesome, awesome. And anyone else out there, encourage people to get on the air. Help them overcome that mic fright, that stage fright. I know what it is. Those butterflies, man, that nerve. Whew, I know what it is, man. But once you overcome it, once you, once you kind of go past the point of no return, man, there's no better feeling. I love being on stage. I love being on the air. Those are the two greatest feelings in the world. The, the, the adrenaline you get from it. Oh, man, I could go on and on, but I've been talking for seven and a half minutes now, so... <laughs> Let's go to the next question. Thanks again, Mr. X. So the next question has to deal with uh, activating a state in Parks on the Air. So uh, Apple Jacks uh, commented a, a few weeks ago when I was in Denver and I was talking about uh, doing a pod activation and how I activated Colorado. I got Colorado. So he was kind of confused. The park was activated, but then the state was. Did I miss something? I can't find any info on what a state activation is. So I was kind of saying that loosely but what happens is there's all kinds of statistics in parks on the air and one of them is how many states you have activated from so that's what i was getting at i'm activating from colorado i activated colorado so here's my stats you can find this i'll show you where to find this in a second but so i've uh, i've operated from alabama arkansas colorado florida michigan oregon tennessee texas and washington that's on the parks on the air website and you can find that by going to, uh, if you just go to poda.app and you go over to your profile, you gotta sign in, go to my awards and then scroll down here, you'll see here's the activated US states. So those are the states that I personally have been in and, and done a poda activation. And these are all the states that I have hunted. So Alaska, Maine and Hawaii, if you guys could get on the air and you know maybe get in the log, that would be great, okay? Thanks a bunch. So that's what I mean by activating a state. And there's so many stats in parks on the air, it's ridiculous, but you know, for those of you who are into that kind of thing, they're there for you. So I would love to activate all 50 states. I don't think that's realistic, but uh, you know, it, it's neat to have all of those under your belt. So good question, thanks for asking. So our next question is a little stumpy. Uh, and by that, I mean it, there's really not a great answer, but let's get into it anyway. This question is asking about radials on a mag mount. Uh, he's got some shark ham sticks and he might need to add a counterpoise radial. Where can I add them on a mag mount? Well, that question has some inherent problems in it uh, in that a ham stick has the quarter by three eighths thread, okay? So all of this is the center conductor. You can't, add a ring terminal and wire or an alligator. There's, there's just kind of no way to do it on the antenna side. Here's a mag mount. Now mine's an SO239. One thing you could do is uh, maybe if this is metal, now mine is plastic, you might could tap this 
and uh, attach a wire that way if you can put a screw in there and it's metal. I don't know how likely that is, but that would be one thing you might could consider. Another option would be to simply not use the mag mount and use a trunk mount, uh, like a trunk lip mount. This is what I use. This is the Diamond K400 Super Gainer. Uh, and this is simply going to screw uh, onto the bottom of your trunk and those screws are going to kind of bite into the paint a little bit. It's not going to damage it. Don't worry about that. But that alone should be enough to, to make your car the counterpoise if you have problems with the mag mount. I would try the mag mount without. I've, I've had a lot of people tell me that they work just fine without any uh, counterpoise. That would be my advice for that. I, I would seriously consider getting the Super Gainer, though. The, the K400 is uh, probably the... I've, I've gone through a few... Uh, trunk lip mounts and this is the one that's that's really stood the test of time so that's what i would do they're about 80 bucks on gigaparts i'll leave uh, i'll leave a link in the description so hopefully that helps uh there, there's there's no good answer to that question unfortunately but thank you for writing i appreciate it that's a good question our next question has to do about antennas how do you like that my favorite subject <laughs> uh this is a newbie question welcome to the hobby thanks for writing in i appreciate it says he'll be taking his test Monday night. Uh, hopefully you already did because this email came a while ago. Uh, antenna question. How does the size of wire gauge affect the antenna's ability to work properly? I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of comments on this from a lot of experts. The books will tell you that uh, a, a bigger wire gauge or a, or a, a fatter wire is going to be more broadband. So for example, if you use like 12 gauge wire and you make a dipole, say you cut it for the center of 20 meters, right? Theoretically, because you're using a, a thicker wire gauge, your antenna will be more broadbanded. Now, it's been a while since I built a dipole and I made mine out of 14 gauge. I haven't made one yet out of uh, a thinner wire. I am fixing to. Uh, but I use a whole lot of NFED half waves with 26 gauge wire. And most of them uh, are, and I'll, I'll attribute any inconsistencies with user error because I probably built the antenna, but with the, let's go with the antennas that I didn't build. With 26 gauge wire, I can pretty much get the whole band uh, with that. So <laughs> on paper, they're supposed to be more broad banded. As far as working properly, I suppose that depends on your definition of properly, but I put 100 watts through 26 gauge wire, no problem, and they work just fine. So for me, that's working properly. If you're talking about resonance, uh, again, in theory, the thicker stuff's supposed to be more broadband. Good question. Uh, love answering newbie questions. Uh, remember, I say your question's answered poorly. So I, I would love uh, from someone who actually knows what they're talking about, some electrical engineers and such, uh, if you have any comments on this, uh, do leave them. I, I would love to hear it. I'd love to learn more about this subject. So great question. Uh, it's not necessarily a newbie question. You know, we're, we're all learning whether you've been in the hobby for 50 years or you've been in the hobby for two weeks. So cool. Thanks for writing in. I appreciate it. Our last question has to do with vertical antennas and ground moisture. Let's check it out. This viewer writes, uh, when I was starting in radio, your videos influenced me to get a Wolf River Coils. Congratulations. He's got the Silver Bullet 1000. When I use it for portable use, I find that using the legs as a post into the ground rather than base works better. I hear the difference in receiving capability. I live in Louisiana, so the ground is extremely damp. Is this likely the cause? I'm gonna go with an unresounding yes. A wet ground is gonna be a lot better ground for your antenna than a dry ground. I've noticed the difference when I'm using verticals. Uh, the, the damp soil just really seems to help the wigglies get out better. And uh, I actually made myself, uh, I call this the murder spike. Uh, I made this for a video that I never ended up publishing, but um, this is a mirror mount. And this actually is a leg from the Wolf River coils that I have sharpened to a zombie killing spike and put, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a quarter by three eighths uh, thread on there and then the SO239 and uh, I just put the counterpoise wire here. So stabbing this into the ground, one, you have more 
metal conductivity going into the ground, but because the ground is wet, again, it's in these scientific terms here, it's going to enhance and, and, and embiggen the wigglies getting out. Uh, absolutely. I've heard of guys that'll uh, even moisten the ground, moist, <laughs> underneath their dipoles to get a better takeoff angle. So it's, it's amazing what happens with antennas because everything affects everything. And you know, if you really want to go at it, get some salt <laughs> and pour it all around too, guys. Guys will fill their, you look at some of these big contest stations, they'll fill their whole uh, antenna farm with salt water to increase that uh, ground conductivity. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely a thing. I, I don't know how much the fresh water is gonna do versus the salt water, but uh, it, it's definitely gonna help. So, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, you're hearing it, so absolutely. So that's it, gang. Thanks for watching another episode of Mailbag Monday. Again, if you have questions, do hit me up. K8MRD at iCloud.com. Uh, just make sure you put Mailbag Monday in the subject so I actually pay attention to the email as opposed to just breezing past it. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, thumbs up, like it, share it, do all that kind of stuff. Follow me on Twitter at K8MRD. And we will see you again on another episode of K8MRD Radio Stuff. 73, guys.